Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to do 3.1 and 3.2 today. We're going to be talking about Extrema, Wool Serum, and the Mean Value Serum. So I just kind of said all that again. So those are our objectives for today. Remember that our Mean Value Serum is extremely useful. All right. So before we get started, let's talk about the definition of Extrema. And remember, extrema can mean lots of different things. It can mean a minimum or a maximum. It could be a relative min or max, or it could be an absolute or global min or max. But in general, if I have a function evaluated at C, and it is a minimum of the function on an interval, what that means is is that f of c is going to be less than or equal to all of the other y values for all x in that given interval. Okay, so it just means that it's going to be the smallest y value in an interval. On the other hand, if I have f of c is a maximum of a function on an interval, then it's because that f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. So it is the largest y value for all x in the interval. And just remember, we have lots of words that describe extrema. So I can have a relative max or min. And remember, that means that it is in, within a specific interval. I could also have what's called a global or an absolute max or min, and that means that the graph would never go beyond either of those two points. The other thing that's really important when we're talking about is extrema is that you pay attention to your intervals. Is it a, an open interval oops, or a closed interval? So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to the details. The thing that we typically forget for extrema, and this is really important, and we saw this in a lot of our problems on the AP exam, is you need to be very careful. You need to be very careful to test the endpoints because this was a piece that many of us would forget when we were evaluating extrema to test the endpoints on a closed interval because oftentimes a max or a min will occur at an end point, and we miss that if we have forgotten to check that. All right, if we go back and talk about just a couple of definitions that we've seen before for existence theorem. And remember, an existence theorem just tells you that a particular characteristic exists in a specific interval. For example, the intermediate value theorem says if a function is evaluated at its endpoints, A and B, and a sign change occurs, then we know that a zero exists. It doesn't tell us necessarily where, but it tells us that it exists in that interval from A to B. Alrighty, so that's what the intermediate value said. The next one is what's called an extreme value theorem. And again, this is just an existence theorem. And basically, it says that an extrema could, could being the operative word, exist within a certain interval, which means that we probably need to go back and talk about, that's a B, what it means to have an extreme. All right, so I'm going to do that with just a little graph, okay? So let's say I have this cute little graph. Here's my function, and I'm going to have something like that, and then here's going to be my interval from A to B. 
Well, if we talk about extrema, remember that we're really looking at a change in the slope. And that is going to be of our tangent line. So for example, the tangent here is positive. The tangent here is negative which means that in the interval from here to here, since there is a change in sign of my derivative, that means that I have potentially an extrema because at that point, the derivative is going to equal zero. Okay, And I know that a max or a min occurs there because of a sign change in the slope of my derivative. And then down here, I might have another potential extrema because, again, I've had a sign change in my derivative. Okay, um, So I think that kind of addresses everything that I had written down, but we're looking for a sign change. So we're looking for a change in the slope. Specifically, we're looking for a sign change. Okay, Because if I have a positive and a negative, at some point they change. And at that point where they change, I have an extrema. And at an extrema, the derivative of the function at that point is going to be 0 because a horizontal line has a slope of 0. Alrighty. So the first thing that we need to do if we are trying to determine critical values, or sorry, to determine, determine extrema, is to determine our critical values. And if you'll remember, the critical values happen where the derivative of, oops, that's supposed to be a parenthesis, the function is 0. So a critical value is going to be where my derivative is 0, because everywhere that my derivative is 0, I could potentially have an extrema. So if you're asked to find extrema on an interval, okay, we're going to say that it is a closed interval, meaning that the endpoints are included. The first step is always to find those critical numbers. But to be able to find those, you're going to find the derivative and set it equal to 0, and we're going to solve for x. And we're going to solve for x in our derivative. And then we're going to evaluate the function, the original function, at the critical numbers. And remember, those critical numbers include wherever the derivative is 0, and it includes the endpoints of whatever interval you've been given. Okay? So we're going to evaluate our critical numbers. And by critical numbers, I mean that where the derivative is equal to 0, and I'm going to evaluate the endpoint, and then I'm going to determine my extrema. So this is just kind of the beginning of Chapter 3. So we're going to do very little work, um, unlike what will be coming later when we start talking about first and second derivatives, when we start talking about um, extrema and concavity and all kinds of fun things. So for our first example, we're just going to make it nice and polite. I want to find the extrema of f of x is equal to 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed on the interval from a negative 1 to 2. So the first thing that I have to do in my example is find the derivative of my function. So using my simple power rule, I'm going to have 12x cubed minus 12x squared. And then I'm going to set that equal to 0, because my extrema will happen where I have a horizontal tangent of 0. I'm going to factor out a 12x squared, and I'm going to get x minus 1 is 0. So I'm going to get x is 0 and 1. These are my critical values in addition to the negative 1 and 2. So just because I can, I'm going to list those critical values. And it's going to be a negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And besides the fact that you can't see them, I listed them in numerical order. Okay. So 
now I'm going to evaluate my function, the original function at f of a negative 1. And when you do that, you're going to get 7. And I'm going to assume you can do this math. And if I evaluate my original function at 0, I get a 0. And at f of 1, I get a negative 1. And at f of 2, I get 16. So if you'll notice what's happened, okay? So I evaluated the function at the two derivative points and where the slope is 0 and at the endpoint. This is going to be a minimum, and this is my maximum. So since it said to find the extrema, okay, I'm going to write I have extrema, and I'm going to write that I have a minimum at the point 1, negative 1, and I'm going to have a maximum at the point 2, 16. And I didn't include information like um, absolute or relative at this point in that particular interval for that graph. I just know that I have a minimum and a maximum, and that will be sufficient. All right, so if we do our next example, this is a little bit more fun because we have some trig involved. We're going to find the extrema of, and our function is going to be, 2 sine x minus the cosine of 2x. Remember, I got a little chain rule going on right there. And I'm going to do it on the interval from a 0, oops, I forgot the 2, to 2 pi. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find my derivative. And my derivative is going to be 2 cosine x. The derivative of cosine is a negative sine. So 2 negatives is a positive sine of 2x times the derivative of the inside 2. So this is 2 cosine x plus 2 sine of 2x. But I need to set my derivative equal to 0. So I'm going to use the double angle formula here. So my derivative is going to become 2 cosine x plus and then 2 times 2 sine x cosine x. Okay, because that is my double angle. And this is 2 cosine x plus 4 sine x cosine x. I need to solve for my derivative to equal 0, so I'm going to factor out a 2 cosine x, and I'm going to get 1 plus 2 sine x. Set my derivative equal to 0. Now I have two baby equations, so I get the cosine of x is 0. And the sine of x is a negative 1 half. If you'll remember, cosine is 0 when x is pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And I know that if you think about sine, sine is a negative 1. This is um, 2 and this is radical 3. And this is going to be 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. Got to love the trig. Great. So now I need to evaluate my function at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 points. And I'm assuming at this point that you can do this math. So I'm just going to write down our work. So if I evaluate the original function at 0, I get 1. And I'm putting these kind of in order. And then I'm going to do pi over 2, and I get a 3. And if I evaluate the function at 7 pi over 6, I get a negative 3 halves. And if I evaluate the function at 3 pi over 2, I get a negative 1. If I evaluate, sorry you can't see it, if I evaluate the function at 11 pi over 6, I get a negative 3 halves. And my last one, f of 2 pi, and I get a negative 1. So you'll notice I have two minimum values, okay? Did I do my math right? Negative 3 half, negative 1 and a half. My bad. Oopsie. Sorry. So I have 1, 3, negative 2, negative 3 halves, negative 1. Okay, my bad. A negative 1.5 is bigger, so I have two minimums. I'll do it in a different color since I screwed that up. B 
these are going to be my minimum values, and my maximum of value is going to occur right there. So since they asked me to find the extrema, when I report, I'm going to say I have extrema, and then I'm going to have minimum at x is equal to 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6, and I'm going to have a maximum at x is equal to pi over 2. Alrighty, so that is evaluating our extrema. Alright, the next thing that we want to talk about is Rolle's theorem. Alright, and basically here's what Rolle's theorem says. It says, and this is 3.2 by the way, in case you care, that if a function is continuous over the interval a to b and differentiable a -T -I -A -B -L -E, over, oops, round brackets, a to b and if f of a is equal to f of b. All right, so notice that it's saying that I have a continuous function that's differentiable on an open interval, and if the two y values at the end points are the same, then we know there is at least one value where the derivative is going to equal zero, which means that I have a horizontal tangent and it means that I have at least one, so sorry, let's write greater than or equal to one extrema. Okay? Alrighty. So let's just do an example of this, not too difficult. So I'm going to have our function equal x to the fourth minus 2x squared, and I want to find all values of c in the interval of a negative 2 to 2 such that f prime of c is equal to 0. Alrighty, and basically what we're doing is if I substituted in my endpoints, just to illustrate my point, if I did f of a negative 2, I would get, what would I get? I think I would get a 0. Is that true? Um, because it would be a negative 2 to the 4th. It's going to be a positive 16. And then negative 4, oh, it's going to be 8. And then if I evaluated the function at the other endpoint, so 2 to the 4th is 16 minus 8, so I'm still going to get 8. So notice that this is an application of Rolle's theorem because my endpoints yield the same y value, so that means somewhere in the interval from a negative 2 to 2, I have an extrema, and that's what I'm looking for. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative, and I'm going to get 4x cubed minus 4x, and I'm going to set my derivative equal to 0, so I'm going to factor and get x squared minus 1 equals 0 because I know that I'm going to have a horizontal tangent when my derivative is equal to 0, and I'm going to get x is equal to 0 and plus or minus 1. So now I know that I could potentially have three different places where I have a horizontal tangent in the interval from a negative 2 to 2. Alrighty, and if we look at this graphically, so if I were to actually graph our original function. It would look something kind of like that. And notice we said that we had horizontal tangents at 0 and then plus or minus 1. So notice in my original graph I have 1, 2, 3 horizontal tangents. So in theory this confirms my answer. And so I would say that f prime of c is equal to 0 when c is equal to 0 and plus or minus 1. Alrighty, so the next thing that we want to talk about is our mean value theorem. If you remember from Calc 1, it is a very valuable theorem. So the mean value theorem 
is also an existence theorem, which means that in an interval, a certain characteristic exists. So this one says, if the function is continuous on an interval from A to B, and it's differentiable, meaning that I can just take the derivative on the, on the open interval A to B, then the derivative evaluated at C is just going to be the slope of the secant line, which is what the mean value theorem says, because not always do we have a function that we can evaluate where I want to find a derivative, but if I don't know the equation, that's okay, because I can still use the mean value theorem and still come up with um, my average rate of change. So remember that my derivative of the secant, so the derivative of the secant is going to equal the derivative of the function, and I know my notation is horrible, but it's just to illustrate a point, and then that's going to give me my average rate of change on my endpoint A to B, okay? which is why we use the mean value theorem. All right, so let's do an example using our handy dandy mid value, mid mean value theorem. Sorry, brain and mouth aren't working at the same speed. I'm going to be told that f of x is equal to 5 minus 4 over x, and I want to find all values of c in the interval 1, 4, such that f prime of c is equal to f of 4 minus f of 1 over 4 minus 1. So this is actually an interesting application of the mean value theorem. So they're telling you that you can find the derivative, and they're telling you that they want the derivative to equal this, so we're going to be able to kind of work backwards. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find my derivative, and I'm going to rewrite my function to be 5 minus 4x to the negative 1. So my derivative is 4x to the negative 2, which is 4 over x squared. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to evaluate the derivative at c to find out what value they want us to set it equal to. So if I do f of 4 minus f of 1 over 4 minus 1, well, 5 minus 1 is going to be... Oh, sorry, 5 minus 1, because 4 divided by 4 is 1. So 5 minus 1 is 4, and then the function evaluated at 1 is 1 over 4 minus 1 is 1. So they're telling us that the slope of the derivative is going to be 1, and I want to find the points where this is true. So if I set 4 over x squared equal to 1, cross multiply, I'm going to get x is equal to plus or minus 2. So I would know that the slope of the tangent line is going to be equal to 1 when x is a plus or minus 2. So I'm going to write in the interval from 1 to 4, x is equal to, but notice that they originally said go from 1 to 4 so the negative value doesn't work. x is 2 yields a derivative of 1. And then I've answered the very specific question that's asked. Alrighty, I think I have one more example for us. Yep, just one. Lucky dogs. And this is a great example of the mean value theorem. It's actually really pretty fun. All right, at 9.13 a.m., a sports car is traveling 35 miles per hour, seemingly very innocuous. Two minutes later, the car is traveling 85 miles an hour. Not bad. Maybe they're entering an on-ramp for a highway and they had to get up to speed. But we want to prove 
that at some point in the two minute time interval, the car's acceleration And remember that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. The acceleration is exactly 1,500 miles per hour squared, which means that the driver of the cool sports car, the driver of the cool sports car, is now about to get a ticket for excessive I think I spelled it wrong, excessive acceleration. That's a sad day. Yay, calculus. All right, so let's talk about what we have. So at time is equal to zero hours, and I'm going to choose hours because my velocity is in miles per hour. My car is going 35 miles per hour. Well, two minutes later, so two out of 60, except I wrote the wrong number 2 out of 60, right? The car is now traveling 85 miles per hour, okay? Well, one, 2 over 60 reduces to be 1 over, gosh, I can't write, brain and mouth aren't working. So I have 1 30th of an hour. So I know that my velocity is going to be equal to miles per hour and my acceleration is the derivative of velocity, and it's going to be miles per hour squared. Well, I don't really have an equation to take the derivative of, so I'm going to take the derivative of the velocity to estimate my acceleration by using the mean value theorem. So it says that my mean value theorem says that the acceleration is going to equal v prime of t, which is just f of um, 1 over 30 minus f of 0 over 1 over 30 minus 0. So that's the math that we're actually doing. So when I find my acceleration, which remember is the derivative of velocity, F of 130 is 85 minus 35 over 1 over 30. So subtract 0 when it's 0. So I get 50 times 30 over 1, which is 1,500 miles per hour squared. So busted. So simple little math for your friendly neighborhood police officer to do in the car, and then he can show the judge that you do indeed deserve a ticket. Alrighty, that's it for today. I will see you guys tomorrow.